Hi, my name is Dennis Biddle. I would like to welcome you to the Gospel Truths, your pathway to heaven. Today's lesson is titled, Be Ye Angry and Sin Not. I bring this subject today because in my heart I think it's neat. There's so much division going on in the church today. So much anger, so much hatred, so much bitterness dismay. I want to say, to be frank, at the end of the day when all the smoke is settled, it is Satan who is the author and foundation of all lies and deceit. That are the church focusing on the foundational mission, and that is to teach the gospel so that every person is afforded the opportunity to confess Christ and be baptized for the remission of sins. This is the case it is the same reason why God himself annihilated the 12 tribes of Israel. It was because of their refusal to stand for righteousness. It was their refusal to walk in God's law. It is the same today, this so-called leadership in the churches, I believe is behind most of the unrest and division that exists. I believe if the apostles were to visit the churches today, the words would echo something like this. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you by my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now, this I say that every one of you, I am a Paul and I am Paulus and I am Cephas and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? The apostle Paul, an ambassador for Christ, further reemphasized that it was wrought in Christ when he was raised from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, and not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of all things to the church, which is his body, fullness of him that filleth all in all. And he further expressed, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things. Keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. And I encourage you to know, don't be surprised, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers and having itching ears, and they shall turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. I can go on and on and on and justify this fact, Christ is the head of all things to the church, which is his body. This is one reason why we need to stop this abuse and obliteration when one expressed themselves as going to church. Those same people in the church today try to justify pressing God in the fashion as brick and mortar. How can a person who claims to know God lower God down to such a detriment? It was Jesus himself who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon the form of a servant, it was made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath ex highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And this is why we must accept Christ as the head of the church. And I tend... We think that God, after all what he went through, leaving glory, leaving his heavenly throne, coming down to earth to live amongst us, endured all the hatred and the backstabbing and the lying and the cheating and all the cruelty that man possessed. If you think he's going to turn around after all that and give the jurisdiction and the 
control and the deity of the church to a mortal man, I think something's wrong with your thinking. I am so glad before our Lord and Savior went back to glory, he left us with grace and mercy. This brings me to the point of the lesson, be ye angry and sin not. Many of us have taken the notion that it is sinful to be angry. I've heard in many Bible classes that took this stance. They forget that it was our Lord Jesus himself when he had made a scourge of small cords. He drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and over through the tables. I think you would agree with me that Jesus was pretty angry, pretty upset. I hope that you don't get the wrong impression that I'm insinuating that one can at liberty be angry or express anger without having proper cause. Yes, I say proper cause. There is a just cause for being angry. But I do want to warn this expression of be angry and sin not. I want you to contemplate this warning of liberality and ungoverned passion. Many of us can relate in being angry on an issue. A family member, many of us are guilty of being angry or displaying anger towards our children or something we felt they did that was of deserving, being right or wrong. I am convinced without reservation, I believe you would agree during the disciplinary of our children, it was done in a not so calm expression, even to the point where we probably said some things in the time of this anger, we regretted it later. So it's very difficult to scrutinize this expression in restriction and sin not. I say if we have a just occasion to be angry at any time, we need to see that it is without sin. Lately, it has been on the news about a few professional football players who was punished by the league because of their inability to control their anger to the point their anger became excessive and their reactions due to their anger was not tolerated by the league. I will put it this way. If we would be angry and not sin, we should be angry at nothing but sin. We should be more zealous for the glory of God and than for any interest or reputation of our own. One's enormous and common sin and anger is to allow it to burn into a passion of rage and then let it rest in our membrane. I believe this is what the Apostle Paul was warning against. Now here's a quick remedy to consider. If we have been provoked and have had our spirit, our feelings greatly discomposed, we are bitter and resentful towards any attempt of a resolution offered. Before the night passes, it is wise to make every effort to satisfy issue and be reconciled back to the offender. And let be gone, be gone. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, the Bible teaches. If it burn into wrath and bitterness of the spirit, we need to see to it that we suppress it quickly. Beware, I warn, although anger in itself is not sinful, but there is an apparent danger of it becoming if we are not careful and do not quickly suppress it. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. Those who persevere in sinful anger and in wrath does nothing but give glory to the devil. I want to move now to the conclusion of this matter, but before I do, I wish to declare the Hebrew word that depicts the physical expression of God's anger in the Old Testament from the book of Genesis to the book of Malachi. The Hebrew word in the Strong's Concordance is 639, pronounced as alf, spelled A-L-F, A-P-H, alf, or off. It comes from another word that expresses God's anger, 599, and it's pronounced as onaf or onaf. Neither word deviates from its intent and meaning and the expression. It exemplifies the physical expression and disposition when God Almighty himself was enraged or angry. 
It defines as the nose or nostril, the face, and occasionally a countenance expression on the face, forbearing forehead, suffering the nostril, the snout, wrath. The primary word defines it as a breathing of hardness, a anger, a displeased expression. Case point, 1 King chapter 11, verse 9. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. Another example that we can look at that depicts God's disposition is in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 20. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. I want you to know that in every instance, this word alf, off, or on off, or now, it was used to express God's disposition when the children of Israel refused to stay in line with God's word. There was an occasion in the early church where a certain group of Christians that was under the influence of the Old Testament law, they were trying to persuade the Christians who were not under this influence that they needed to be circumcised to fulfill or to complete their Christian approval or acceptance or to be saved. This issue created no small dissension. This word dissension depicted in this scripture, Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 2, it defined it as a popular uprising, uproar, or a controversial conversation or discussion, an insurrection. And without going further into detail of this story, I maintain the position that it was common during the early churches in having these serious and controversial and contentious discussions, even to the point where Christians got upset on these issues, but be angry and sin not. It was an occasion in the book of Acts chapter 15, verse 36 to 41, where the apostle Paul and Barnabas had a discussion and in agreement, they decided that it would be good and beneficial to visit the brethren in every city where they had preached the word to see how they were doing. But during this conversation, Bible expressed that a heated discussion developed. This discussion wasn't based on a scriptural matter. It wasn't based on a matter of biblical interpretation. It wasn't based on who was right or who was wrong. It was something so minute in its nature. The Bible depicts the conversation as contentious and so sharp between them. This sharp contention was developed due to the fact that the Apostle Paul disagreed with Barnabas who suggested that they should take another Christian brother with them on the visit. Now that's pretty simple. That's pretty straight out minute. And we would think something like this would not develop into such a contentious, such division, such argumentative state. But apparently it was a serious issue. Paul's position of reason for not wanting to take this brother, John, whose surname was Mark, with them was that it would not be good to take Mark because Mark had departed from them on another occasion. And he did not go to help them do the work. Apparently, Mark was a scatter. Things got hot, he scattered. We have Christians like this today. When things get controversial, things get heated. When it's time to stand up for what's right. When it's time to stand up against injustice. People tend to run and hide. They refuse to hold on to God's unchanging hand. This was the case with Mark, I believe. I don't blame Paul. I would have taken his stance also. Most people don't want to stand up for what's right because they want to keep their popularity among their friends. They're all about themselves and their feelings. Their concern is not about righteousness, but about how their friends might feel towards them if they take a godly stance. But I want you to know if you are afraid to take a righteous stand on issues that may seem controversial or contentious or heated, you ain't fit for the kingdom of God. You ain't fit to wear God's name. You ain't 
fit to be a child of God. And I will go a little further and I will say this. If you say you know God and you say you believe in God and you say you love God but you're not willing to stand on this conviction, you are a liar and a truth is not in you. 1 John chapter 2 verse 4 says, He that said I know him and keeping not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So I encourage you, my brothers and sisters, listen and take heed to what the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. So you be angry and it's your God-given right. You stand up for righteousness sake. When your neighbor, when your family, when your so-called brethren in the church refuse to stand up against injustice, when they refuse to teach truths, when they get in their little secret corners and they plot against you with lies and deceit, when they refuse to allow God's word to correct them, when they refuse to talk the gospel talk, you hold on, you hold on to God's unchanging hand, but remember, if we would be angry and not sin, we should be angry at nothing but sin. I'm coming to my conclusion now. I want to say to you today that somewhere along the way, you should have discovered something so dear, so precious to you. It is so eternally worthful that you would never give it up. You ought to discover some principle in your life. You ought to have this one great faith that unmovable, that you would never give it up. Somehow you got to hold on to this one faith and say, if it be so, my God, whom I serve is able to deliver me. But if not, Lord, I'm going to keep this one faith. I'm going on anyhow. I'm going to stand up for righteousness anyway. What does this mean? It means in a final analysis, you do what's right. Not doing what's right to avoid hell or if you're doing right merely to keep from going to something that traditional religious people has called hell, then you are not doing right. If you do right merely to a condition that religious people call heaven, you're not doing right. If you're doing right to avoid pain and to achieve happiness and pleasure, then you're not doing right. Ultimately, you must be truthful because it's right to be truthful. You must be honest ultimately because it's right to be honest. You must be just because it's right to be just. You must love ultimately because it's lovely to love. And I stand here and say to you this day, if you have never found something so dear and so precious to you that you wouldn't die for it, then you are not fit to live. You may be 18 or 35 or 78 years old. And one day some opportunity stands before that calls upon you to stand for righteousness, for justice, for some great principle, some great issue, and some great cause. And you refuse to do it because you are afraid or you refuse to do it because you want to live longer or you are afraid you will lose your job or you are you're afraid you'll be criticized or you would lose your popularity or you're afraid you might get hurt or killed. So you refuse to take the stand to do what's right. Well, you may go on to live till you're 90 years old. But you just as dead at 18 or 35 if you would be at 90. The sensation of your breathing in your life is but an illusion, a belated announcement of an early death of the spirit. You died when you refused to stand up for what was right. You died when you refused to stand up for truth. You died when you refused to stand up for justice. So it is my prayer that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, should keep your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. I hope this lesson blesses you. I would like to thank you for tuning in. This is the Gospel Truth.